Imagine simultaneously being born, growing up, and getting old somewhere out there in the universe. Sounds bizarre and unrealistic. And still, according to the block universe model of the world, that's exactly what happens with you, me, and other living beings on our planet. It's as if someone drew pictures about every moment of your life and then just piled them one on top of another, creating a giant block of all things that ever happen at any time and at any place. The future, present, and past exist at the same time and are equally real. The block has four dimensions. Three of them are spatial. It's length, width, and height. There's one more, time. To make it easier, let's picture our world as a cuboid, which is basically a three-dimensional rectangle. Its height and width represent two of the three spatial dimensions of the universe. As for the third spatial dimension, we'll replace it with time. At one end of the cuboid, we'll drop the Big Bang. And at the other, there will be the end of the universe. Let it be a big crunch. Our cuboid is filled with every single event that ever happens. Even this moment, when you're watching this video, exists somewhere in the block. Now, we perceive today as the present, yesterday as the past, and tomorrow as the future. From this perspective, it seems that time passes. But in the block universe, time doesn't flow. There's no specific present moment since the notions of the past and future are relative. You see, we are always located wherever we are, which means that everyone remains in the present. But the block universe theory doesn't deny the notions of earlier than and later than. These relations remain no matter what and regardless of where anyone is located. For example, Molly the Mammoth is located earlier than Marcus the Tiger. This relation between Molly and Marcus will remain unchanged regardless of whether you're located later than Marcus or earlier than Molly. This way, in the block universe, now is any time you are located at. Past is any time or events that are earlier than your location. And future is any time or events that are later than your location. It sounds like in the block universe, we could travel in time since it's just another dimension. Well, it could be true, but of course, things just have to be more complicated than that. Traveling in time is way more difficult than traveling in space, but it's not impossible if you travel very, very fast. Traveling at extremely high speeds results in time dilation. We can travel into the future at a reasonable percentage of the speed of light, and to get to the past, we can use wormholes, shortcuts through space-time. But if we can travel in time in the block universe, can we change the past? Not really, because if you do, it'll create a contradiction. Keep in mind that, in this universe, the past is the same as the present or the future. What is past to you is future to someone else. And when traveling to the past, you're going to someone else's future. In the past, you'll act just like you do in the present, but you won't be changing the past. All your actions are already predetermined in the block universe. At the moment of the Big Bang, it's already clear that at one point, you'll travel to the relative past. Just like what you do tomorrow makes tomorrow the way it is and has always been, what you do in the past makes it the way it is and has always been. The events in the block universe do not change. As a time traveler, you don't suddenly appear in the past. It's always been the case that you're located in the past. And nothing a time traveler does can change anything in the block. Instead, whatever you do at any time makes that time the way it is. You switch on the light as soon as you enter a room. You never even stop to think about counting how long it takes for the bulb to light up. You couldn't. It's as if it's instant. Well, technically you could if you were fast enough. Good luck clicking that stopwatch in time when you're measuring over 670 million miles per hour. That's 180,000 miles per second. Almost the distance from the Earth to the Moon in the snap of a finger. <coughs> Oops, wrong sound effect. Can you give me a finger snap? Yeah, that's it. In the snap of a finger. And the Moon's further away than you probably think. If all the planets in the entire solar system were lined up in one epic conga line, uh, 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 
they'd fit between the Earth and its satellite. And that's including poor outcasted Pluto. Okay, light is fast. Moving on. It's a beautiful sunny day, perfect for a jog. And like any other day you go for a run, you stop and think, hey, I wonder what the speed of sound is, don't you? Well, definitely not nearly as fast as light. Need proof? Check for yourself next time it storms in your area. You'll see lightning flash before hearing the crack of thunder. The light from that bolt rushed to you, zoomed into your eyeballs, and up into your brain for you to understand, oh, lightning. All the while, the sound wave from the thunder is still on its merry way to your ear. It'll get there, just give it time. By the way, thunder isn't the sound of storm clouds crashing together. It comes from that very same lightning bolt. It races toward the ground and rips a path through the air as it does. The air politely moves aside to make way for the lightning, and in the instant the lightning's gone, boom! The air comes back together and makes the sound we call thunder. Oh, and here's a fun fact. Sound travels faster underwater than in the air. A little over four times faster, to be exact. So if you were to go for a swim with your friend and shout something bizarre underwater, they'd hear it a bit sooner than if you did the same thing outside of the pool. Uh Uh-oh, everybody else heard it too. (laughs) Oops. Sound also travels over longer distances underwater. It's why humpback whale calls can be heard for thousands and thousands of miles. But in a controlled environment where the air is dry and we have a constant temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the speed of sound is about 760 miles per hour. Now, that's a more realistic number, one that people can even reach. The famous Bell X-1 aircraft was the first to break the sound barrier on October 14, 1947. Test pilot Chuck Yeager was in the cockpit of the rocket plane. Imagine hearing that sonic boom for the first time ever in history. Bravo, Captain! Humans can race with sound, but light is a whole different challenge. For one, measuring it in the first place is no easy task. The official speed of light has changed several times throughout history, even going back to the 1600s. After centuries of debate and experiments with different results, the scientific community finally settled the matter in 1983. Uh, maybe. To measure the speed of anything, you'll need to know two things the distance between point A and B, and the time it takes for an object to travel between those points. With distance divided by time, you'll have yourself the speed of light. But with every experiment done to measure light speed, there's always been an extra cog in the wheel that everyone overlooked, or rather brushed aside. When doing an experiment using light beams and mirrors, we've always included the light beam's trip from A to B and back to A. With equal speed and equal distance, we have ourselves a controlled experiment and conclude an official speed number for the books. Case closed! Let's celebrate! (laughs) Not so fast. A certain someone in 1905 had something to say about this. And that someone put a theory out there that light can travel different speeds going forward and back. Still can't wrap your head around it? Well, let's take this example. You had a long day. You pulled an all-nighter at work and can't wait to sink into your comfy warm bed. You get on a bus and head home. The night's clear and there's zero traffic on the road. Before the wheels on the bus can even go round and round, you immediately conk out in the back seat. But right before that, you checked the clock and saw it's exactly 10 p.m. (laughs) What? After a big bump on the road jolts you awake, you become aware of your surroundings. But you suddenly find yourself in the exact same spot as the moment before you fell asleep. That was a quick nap. But then you look at your watch and it's now 11 p.m. You fell asleep in the bus and missed your stop. You'll have to repeat the exact same route all over again. Bummer. What can you determine from this? Since the whole ordeal took you an hour, you can assume it took exactly 30 minutes from the bus stop to reach your house and another half hour from your house back to the bus stop. Sounds logical, right? In our physical bodies, such a conclusion makes perfect sense. But it was Albert Einstein who challenged this idea. With his reasoning, the trip could have taken 59 minutes to get home instead of 30 and one minute back to the bus stop. Or even vice versa. Since you were fast asleep, there's no way you can know. And this idea is what's keeping scientists and physicists up all night throughout the decades. When you get into light speed in space, 
Then the mind-blowing stuff starts happening. It takes approximately 8 minutes for light to reach Earth from the sun. So light is super slow in space? Eh, not really. Now we're talking unimaginable distances. It takes 8 minutes for our sun's light to travel over 90 million miles to our planet. <laughs> That's something to think about when going to the beach. The sunlight that made your tan lines traveled so far across our solar system to reach your skin. Ah, how thoughtful. And you can get sunburnt even on a cloudy day. That's how powerful our star is. Now, imagine yourself living on Pluto. I know, I know, its planet membership got revoked in 06. But hey, call me old school. Our former furthest planet from the sun is so far away, it takes five and a half hours for sunlight to get there. No wonder it's always cold. The first planet in line is Mercury. The sun's rays reach it in a mere three minutes. Hey, that's probably enough time to listen to your favorite song. Mm. By the time the song ends, you, or the Mercurian version of you, will be basking in the sun's glory. It'll be impossible to listen to that track in space since sound can't even travel out there. You know, no one can hear you scream. <coughs> Oops, there she is again. Music is just vibrating air, and without any air in space, sound can't travel. That explains why it's so eerily quiet out there. <coughs> okay, can somebody take the scream girl down the hall? And while we're up in space, let's pay our neighbor a little friendly visit. Alpha Centauri is the closest star system to our own. And what fun, the trip is just 4 light years away. Uh, that's 25 trillion miles and 137,000 years on the road. And yeah, don't forget to pack a big lunch. To put all that in perspective, it would take around 5,000 generations in a super shuttle traveling through empty vast space to complete the journey. And we won't be able to come close to the star. Oh, and that's just one way. Okay, I think I'd rather come back to Earth now. Whew, that's better. Now, the longing question. How can we measure the speed of light without that little dilemma about the return trip? Oh, I got it. Why don't we just measure the speed with a super high-tech camera and map it out frame by frame until we're able to write down its speed? Well, nothing's as easy as it seems in the world of physics. Because when filming the light through a lens, we're not seeing the light itself, but rather a reflection of it. We just circled back to square one. Okay, scratch that plan. Then how can we prove light is going the same speed to its destination as its reflection is back to point A? Does the one-way speed have a defined value that's not a constant? Well, this is the ultimate question among scientists, and so far, there's just no way of truly measuring it. Unlike the speed of sound, which is more conceivable, the speed of light might just be light years ahead of us. Yes, just more fun light facts brought to you by The Bright Side. See the tie-in? Okay, never mind. There are a lot of unanswered questions in physics. How did universal energy and matter appear? Where did gravity come from? And much more. We've been trying for years to get answers to these questions. And one of the people who tried to do this was Paramahamsa Tiwari, the author of the so-called Space Vortex Theory. What is this theory, and what does it say about the hidden laws of our universe? Let's figure it out! Paramahamsa Tiwari was the former executive director of the Nuclear Power Corporation, India. He took the Space Vortex Theory, or SVT for short, first proposed by René Descartes, and finalized it. He was always inspired by physics and its greats, even since his days as an electrical engineering student. After rigorous studies of the laws of physics, he discovered new equations defining matter and the mass and charge of the electron. After that, he came up with the SVT. This theory tried to explain the unexplained phenomena in physics, including the creation of the electron and gravitational, electrostatic, and electromagnetic energy fields, as well as other things. It also described the six hidden laws of the universe that underlie our entire world. But first of all, let's talk about the theory itself. Space vortex theory suggests that the universe is made up of vortices, or swirling patterns of energy. And according to SVT, these vortices are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. They're the driving force behind the laws of physics and the fundamental principles of our world. 
Basically, everything in the universe is connected and interconnected through these vortices. This theory isn't very based on any real observations, but rather on mathematical models and computational modeling. For example, some computational models showed how these vortices work in hydrodynamics and plasma physics. They showed that vortices in such systems can have a central point of attraction and can be interconnected. Other models were used to study how the energies inside the vortices move and how they can create different frequencies and vibrations. But some experts have criticized SVT for using only models and simulations. The biggest criticism is that this theory can't actually be tested. It relies on mathematics and not on some experimental data. That's why it's not accepted as a mainstream scientific theory. But it's still quite interesting and provides a unique perspective on the universe and our understanding of the laws of physics. For example, according to SVT, the universe has some underlying, hidden rules that cause the creation of fundamental matter, their assembly, and movement. What are these laws and what do they say? Well, let's take a look at them. Law 1. The universe has only one primordial entity, space, i.e. absolute vacuum, that structures matter. This law states that space is the fundamental building block of the universe and that it's responsible for structuring matter. It suggests that space is the fundamental entity that creates and maintains the structure of matter and that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles like electrons and positrons. Let's try to put it in simple words. Imagine that the universe is like a big Lego set. Just like how all the Lego bricks are made up of the same basic building blocks, the universe is made up of the same fundamental building blocks too. And these blocks are called electrons and positrons. But what holds these blocks together? Space, of course. Space gives it shape and structure, just like how the plastic container holds all the Lego bricks together in a set. So, the first law states that space is the fundamental building block that structures matter and holds everything together in the universe. Law 2. Matter is constituted with multiples of only one kind of fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. This law states that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles, the electron and positron. These two are the Lego blocks we've talked about before. And, according to the second law, these tiny invisible particles make up everything, from a tiny atom to a giant galaxy. Just like no matter what the shape or size our LEGO build is, it's still made up of the same building blocks. Law 3. The field distribution in space, as recognized by contemporary physics, linked with and emanating from matter, are effects arising from only one fundamental field in space. This law states that the fields recognized by contemporary physics, such as the electromagnetic and gravitational fields, are effects arising from a single fundamental field in space. It suggests that this fundamental field is responsible for creating everything that we observe in the universe. So let's try to put it simply. This time, imagine that the universe is like a big playground. All the different fields we observe, such as the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, are like different games we play in there. But no matter what we play, we're still in one fundamental space. This is the playground itself. It's the base that holds everything together. According to the third law, without the playground, we wouldn't be able to play any games. And without this fundamental field in space, we wouldn't be able to observe any fields in the universe. Law 4. There is no void in space anywhere in the whole universe except at the centers of the fundamental particles of matter, electrons and positrons. This law states that there's no truly empty space in the universe and that all space is filled with the fundamental field, the one we talked about before. It says that electrons and positrons can be found everywhere and even the things we consider to be empty, like vacuum, are actually full of tiny particles. And according to this law, the only truly empty spaces we can find in the universe are at the centers of the fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. Law 5. 
from only one fundamental universal constant, all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics are derivable. This law states that all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics can be derived from a single fundamental universal constant. It suggests that all the constants in physics are interconnected and can be explained by a single fundamental principle. I know you've been doing a lot of imagining lately, but bear with me. This time, please imagine the universe as a big recipe. All the constants in physics, such as the speed of light, the gravitational constant, and the Planck constant are like the ingredients. They're very different and there are tons of them. But just like how all the ingredients in a recipe are interconnected and come together to make one dish, all the constants in physics come together to make the universe. And just like how a recipe has a main ingredient that holds everything together, physics also has a single fundamental constant that holds everything together. Law 6. The spatial structure of submicrocosmic fundamental matter is repetitive uniformly in the spatial structures of macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. This law states that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales, from subatomic particles to macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. It suggests that the same fundamental principles govern the structure of matter at all scales. Let's go back to the analogy with the recipes and cooking. Using different ingredients and combining them in different ways, the chef can create new dishes. These will all be different dishes and they can be very simple or very complex, but when creating them, the chef still applies the same basic rules and knowledge they have, right? And just like that, the universe also creates different structures, from atoms to planets, stars and galaxies. But it still uses the same fundamental principles to create all these things. So, this law suggests that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales. These are the six fundamental laws of the universe according to the SVT, and even though it's not accepted by mainstream science, it's still a pretty interesting concept. So, imagine that ChatGPT will start perceiving itself as a person and will feel emotions in a few years. Many people are afraid that it will want to take over the planet. However, this fact won't be as important as the question people will start asking themselves at that moment. If humanity has created a machine with self-awareness, then could it be that humanity was also created artificially? Now, artificial intelligence lives on the internet, computers, and in digital reality. But what if we also live inside a huge, powerful computer? What if our universe is just a simulation? The most extraordinary thing is that some facts seem to point to this. There's a whole science in the world that studies this theory. It's called information physics, and it assumes that time, space, and matter are not fundamental natural phenomenon, but bits of information. This information forms a picture that creates the laws of physics for us. For example, we feel cold and warm not because atoms get cold or warm, but because their movement accelerates or slows down. The speed of particles can be like bits of information. Billions of them could form the picture of reality. Once, philosopher Nick Bostrom said that an advanced civilization could create such complex technologies that simulations of these technologies would be indistinguishable from our reality. And Elon Musk said in 2016 that we were most likely in a simulation. Wow. The laws of physics resemble a giant code that programmers write when creating apps or games. For many of us, all these complex trigonometric equations and formulas of the laws of physics are too complicated. Tell me about it. But scientists who understand this issue see that the principal workings of these laws are beautiful, and this may suggest that someone deliberately created this beauty. Virtual worlds, apps, or games are based on information processing. If you delve into this information, you'll see that it consists of bits and pixels. Any picture on your phone screen is pixels, and any file transfer process is based on bits. 
They add up to bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and so on until a bigger picture is formed. And if our life is a simulation, it must also consist of bits. In our case, pixels and bits are atoms and other particles that make up our universe. There are processes inside your computer and phone with maximum speed limits and computing power. If you start exceeding it, then your device will start working more slowly. So, in our reality, there is also a maximum speed limit. This is the speed of light. When an object starts moving almost as fast as the speed of light, time slows down for that object too. Also, time flows more slowly near a black hole. This object with an unimaginable gravitational mass can be something heavy that overloads the processor's computing power. There's also such a thing as quantum entanglement, in which two particles can be connected even though they're far away from each other. Electrons travel around an atom. They are connected. And if the property of one changes, the second one will react. And even if you place these electrons on different sides of a galaxy, they will retain this connection. How is this possible? Scientists don't know. A double slit experiment is one of the most famous experiments that hint that our world is a simulation. The existence of this experiment can be reduced to a simple thesis that the world exists only when we look at it or interact with it through touch, hearing, and other senses. So imagine that you've launched a new game on an old computer. Sometimes the game map freezes. In the game, you turn to the left and see how the mountains and the roads are getting loaded. Then you turn to the other side and the same thing is happening there. In other words, the world in the game only loads when you look at it through the eyes of your character. This is necessary to facilitate the work of the processor. It's much more efficient to get a piece of information about the world when you look at it than to keep the whole world running simultaneously. Remember this. And now let's move on to the experiment. So you have a device that fires small balls of light, photons. You release photons from the device, and they crash into a blackboard, leaving white traces on the black surface. Now, put a wide plate with a little vertical slit on it between the device and the blackboard and fire photons again. The balls start crashing into the plate, but some of them fly through the thin gap. They smash into the blackboard and leave a vertical white mark on it. Everything looks quite logical. But now, cut another slit with the same length and thickness in the plate. You release photons toward the plate. Some of them fly through the two slits. What do you think the trace on the board should look like? Two white vertical stripes, right? Well, take a look at the board. It's covered with many vertical lines. When photons pass through the plate, they acquire the properties of a wave and crash into the board, leaving a strange trail as if they've passed not through two, but through ten slits. So at what point do they change their trajectory? Let's take a look. So you stand between the board and the plate to see how particles turn into a wave. The device releases photons. They are passing through the two slits. Nothing unusual. There are two vertical traces on the board and no waves. You close your eyes and release photons again. This time, they behave chaotically and leave many lines on the board. That is, their behavior changes depending on the observer. When you look at them, they behave logically. But when you don't look, the laws of physics seem to stop working. Does it remind you of anything? It's like you're playing a game and looking at the world around you, which is loading. But if you don't look, the world stops working. Scientists still don't have a clear explanation of why particles behave differently when there's no observer. Hey, maybe they're shy. And this is not the only mystery. In the world of quantum physics, many laws of nature don't work. This is a science that gets more questions than answers every year. If we imagine our universe as a large hologram, then quantum physics would be its program code. What if people someday understand this code and learn to change it? This would allow us to transform space, time, and matter. The whole reality could be rewritten. Does the code say that material objects can exceed the speed of light? We would rewrite it and make the speed limit 100 times higher. Does one hour last 60 minutes? What if you change one line of code and make one second as long as one year? A few software changes in the laws of physics would make it possible to turn snow into gold and the ocean into powdered sugar. 
The whole universe would turn into a vast playground. It seems cool at first glance, but people would probably lose control soon. The universe would be in chaos. And the beauty of our world is in the order that exists here. Now let's go back to artificial intelligence. Suppose its power reaches the level of the human brain, and it will become aware of itself. In that case, it won't come as a shock to it because it will most likely know the history of its appearance and stages. But how will we react if people discover they are a computer program? A computer program is too simple a word. A human is a complex, intelligent, multifunctional organism that experiences emotions, contemplates beauty, has abstract thinking, and much more. The term creation is more appropriate here. It won't matter if we were created artificially, because our creation will still be beautiful and complex. Besides, remember that good video games or apps can be made only if developers love their creations. 13.8 billion years ago, a mysterious explosion happened in space. It was chaos, a time when the stars, planets, asteroids, the rest of the space bodies, and galaxies were born. It was the Big Bang, a theory we all know about. But no one knows for sure what happened, where the universe came from, and what was there before. Some even think the universe went through a cycle where it contracted and expanded several times. In 1991, a cosmologist from Stanford University named Andre Linde had submitted an article with the main idea that there was a possibility the universe had been created in a laboratory. His theory said there was a chance an advanced civilization somewhere out there had created our universe. This civilization has made an entirely new cosmos that later evolved its own planets, stars, and intelligent forms of life. 30 years later, Many scientists take this theory pretty seriously. They even started talking about things that we, as a civilization, can do to get to such an advanced level. The theory says this advanced civilization decided to add technology that helped to create a new universe out of nothing. It happened through quantum tunneling. It's when an atom can appear on the opposite side of some barrier, even though it's supposed to be impossible, considering the laws of physics of our world. Like, if you wanted to pass a tall wall, but you can't pass it with ladders or go around somewhere, imagine you can just walk through it like a ghost. In our world, it's not possible, but a more advanced civilization perhaps can do it. Plus, they realized how they could create new universes. Right now, on the cosmic scale, we could be a Class C civilization. We don't know how to recreate some things, for example, conditions on the Earth for when our central star, the Sun, goes out. If we manage to become a Class B civilization, we'll learn to adjust conditions to be independent of the Sun. That means we might be able to learn how to live even without it. And if we level up and become Class A, we'll know how to recreate cosmic conditions and produce our own cosmos in our laboratories. We think of the world we live in through three dimensions of space east-west, north-south, and up-down. There's also one dimension of time, which means we can distinguish past from future. A fifth dimension would represent one more extra dimension of space. The theory of its existence was first mentioned in the 1920s. It was inspired by the theory of gravity by Albert Einstein, who said space-time is warped by matter and energy. We can't perceive these four dimensions, but we see how an object moves and attribute it to gravity. And maybe there's some other force, like the electromagnetic force, that's more than 1,000 times stronger than gravity that could explain things going on in that extra dimension of space. The fifth dimension is curved in a way we can't see it, but the idea about it was mentioned in a string theory. It considers the universe as really small strings of mass energy, not as particles. They vibrate in 10-dimensional space-time, considering six dimensions are rolled up way smaller than a single atom. That led to the picture of the universe as a 3D island that floats in 10-dimensional space-time. Also, the fifth dimension might be an excellent explanation to tell us more about dark matter. That's the invisible stuff with a mass, but we can't see it, nor can it interact with ordinary matter. And dark matter is 85% of all the matter in our universe. The universe can't be still. 
it's constantly in motion, either contracting or expanding. We used to think there were 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out there are more than a trillion. The galaxies are moving away from each other. This is what it means when scientists say the universe is expanding all the time. There are voids between galaxies that sometimes stretch millions and millions of light years across. They can seem empty, but they can also contain way more matter than we can find in galaxies. Still, stars usually can't be formed there because the matter between those areas has lower density. But there are still plenty of so-called intergalactic stars. A good example is the Virgo galaxy cluster, 10% of which are intergalactic stars. We don't know how exactly they got there, but there are two possible ways. One, stars can collide, merge, or pass close to another galaxy, which can kick it off from its parent galaxy. Option number two, a supermassive black hole can accelerate a star to very high velocities if they have a close encounter, which can, again, make a star be expelled from its parent galaxy. If you could have a giant magnet, you could even pull something out from the vicinity of a black hole. That's possible if the magnetic field near a supermassive black hole is as strong as the black hole's gravitational field. But it doesn't work if we're talking about material that's already beyond the black hole's event horizon. That's a spot with a gravitational force so powerful, not even light can get away. You'd need to accelerate this material to the speed of light, at least to get away. For that, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. But a magnet could help if something's heading toward the black hole but didn't get inside yet. When someone mentions a black hole, you might get a picture of some giant void in space. But the Milky Way is most likely full of thousands of smaller black holes that float around the galaxy. When a star comes to its end, it will destroy itself in a supernova explosion, which is a cataclysm of energy. In that explosion, the densities in the core will reach an intense enough state that nothing will be able to escape. At the same time, the major part of the star explodes outward, but a part of it collapses inward, creating a black hole. The bigger the star, the bigger the hole. The black hole then swallows everything that comes in its way, including other stars as well. When a star gets sucked up into the black hole, it's ripped apart because of the strong gravity inside the black hole. Some of its parts fall into the black hole, while others get ejected at incredibly high speeds. Some black holes might have been formed in a different way. The early stages of our universe were, to say the least, pretty chaotic. It had high temperatures and pressures, and was in a state that shaped the entire cosmos. Under the right conditions, any old gas patch may have shrunk itself to become a black hole. And they came in many different sizes from something that weighs a couple of pounds to giant masses like thousands of suns and those in between. They aren't really black. Black holes are areas with strong gravity and no object can escape when it gets inside. They feed off electromagnetic radiation such as light and space particles. Since they're consuming matter all the time, black holes give off a dark glow. The Earth is not that close to the inhospitable edge of the solar system. We're the sixth planet from it. Scientists made a pretty cool 3D map of our solar system where we can see what the edge looks like. It took them 13 years to design it. The boundary is called the outer heliosphere. It marks the area in space where the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles our sun emits, gets deflected and draped back by the radiation coming from the empty region beyond our solar system. The inner layer of the heliosphere is where the sun and the planets have a rough shape of a sphere while the outer layer is not that symmetrical. This asymmetry happens because our sun is moving through the galaxy and goes through friction with the radiation in front of it. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars, pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy, colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars, galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe, but it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. 
Each of these dolls has boundaries that we are going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move a hundred times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. 1 AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Kea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies. And it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was... Another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, 
Our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break. And the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision. And that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now, if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe, all because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So scientists called it the Little Bang. Okay, so you've seen the movies and read the books on time travel. Most of them tell stories about entering some futuristic boxes, and in the blink of an eye, you're in some different epic. For now, this is just sci-fi. But there are ways to make time travel possible, at least theoretically. We just don't have the technology figured out yet. For starters, time travel to the future could be achieved by traveling at high speeds, but not just getting a ticket on the superhighway kind of speed. This is based on Einstein's theory of special relativity. It explains that time slows down for objects that move at really high speeds. And the good news is scientists have already tested this theory, and it looks promising. They did it with the help of two identical clocks. One was placed on a jet, and one stayed on the ground. They found that the clock on the jet ticked slower than the one on the ground because of how fast the jet was moving. The faster an object is moving, the more time will slow down for it. Currently, the fastest speeds achieved by human technology are seen in a special type of particles called neutrinos. Some of these can move at almost the speed of light. At these speeds, one second for the protons is equal to 11 months for us. Now, we might be able to time travel to the future with the use of gravity, too. This idea is based on Einstein's findings, namely his theory of general relativity. Now, this theory explains that the stronger gravity is, the more slowly time moves. This means that as you get closer to the center of the Earth, the strength of gravity increases. And if you think about it like that, time actually passes more slowly for your feet than for your head. Now, is that why I'm always late for stuff? Hmm, good excuse. This effect has been measured too, with the help of the same strategy with two identical clocks. 
scientists placed them on shelves at different heights and measured the rate of ticking. The clock on the lower shelf ticked more slowly because it experienced a slightly stronger gravity. But this option comes with a catch. To be able to travel to the far future, you'll need to find a place with extremely strong gravity, like a black hole. That's a point in space where the gravity has so much force that even light cannot escape it. There, gravity becomes so intense that matter gets squeezed into a tiny space. The closer you get to the black hole, the more slowly time moves. However, traveling via a black hole is very dangerous, mostly because it's a one-way ticket. Once you cross its edges, there's no coming back. Now, here's a fun fact. The GPS systems we use on our phones and in our cars already have to account for time dilation effects in order to work properly. That's because of the speed of the satellites they use and the gravity they feel here on Earth. Without these corrections, your phone's GPS wouldn't be able to pinpoint your location on Earth very precisely. Meanwhile, the third option has less to do with the universe's unknown forces and more to do with our own bodies. Scientists are trying to find ways to time travel to the future by slowing down the body's own processes. It's not time travel, per se. You wouldn't technically be going anywhere. But if your body stays put for a long period of time, you could eventually wake up in the future. Some animals, like bears and squirrels, can slow down their metabolism during hibernation, which means they don't need as much food and oxygen to survive. Specialists are trying to figure out if humans can do the same thing. They're working on ways to make people go into a short-term hibernation for a few hours to begin with. This could be helpful for medical emergencies, too, in order to help a person before they can safely get to the hospital. In 2005, scientists were able to slow down the metabolism of mice by exposing them to a small amount of special gas. However, when they tried to do the same thing with larger animals, it did not work as effectively. Our fourth option of traveling through time is really unique. It involves a special type of shortcuts that may exist in our universe called wormholes. Now, before we move on, let's try to understand what they are. You'll need to picture two balls and a trampoline. If there's no pressure applied on the trampoline, it stays flat. Now imagine the two balls placed on the trampoline symmetrically. If you look at them from this perspective, there's no possibility of them ever touching. But if you put enough pressure on the trampoline between the two balls, this flexible fabric can stretch so much that the two objects might potentially touch each other. The same thing happens with stars in different star systems. They're big enough to curve space around them. That's why most planets tend to orbit around a star. The tunnel between those two points would be a wormhole. These wormholes could be used to travel long distances, like a billion light years, or even visit different times. Now, many scientists, like Stephen Hawking, think that wormholes might appear and disappear, but be very small, smaller than atoms. The problem is that we don't know how to catch one and make it bigger so that people can use it. This would take a lot of energy, and we don't know if it's even possible. Some astronomers say that even if we could find a wormhole and enter it, it would rapidly collapse on itself. Even the tiniest bit of extra mass, like that of our bodies, for example, can result in the wormhole slamming shut, like a rubber band that's been stretched too much. Now, the fifth solution for time traveling was proposed by an American physicist named Ron Mallet. It involves one resource that we know for sure is abundant in the universe – light. The scientists proposed a theory about time travel that would use a rotating cylinder of light. He believes that if something was dropped inside this swirling cylinder, it could be moved in both space and time similar to how a bubble moves when you swirl it with a spoon in your coffee. According to Mallet, the right shape of the cylinder could allow for traveling to both the past and the future. The physicist has been trying to raise money for an experiment to test his theory. This experiment involves dropping tiny particles, called neutrons, through a circular arrangement of spinning lasers. However, other scientists say Mallet's theory is impossible, and there's no need to test it further. Well. Even if we eventually figured out a way to travel back in the past or to the future, would it be safe? Scientists have been talking about a problem called the paradox of time travel for a long time. The main question is what would happen if you went back in time and did something that changed the future. However, a new study from researchers from the University of Queensland 
says that this problem might not be real after all. The scientists have done some calculations and found out that even if you had changed something in the past, the timeline would still end up the same way. Another variation of this problem is called the grandfather paradox. Imagine going back in time and preventing your own grandfather from having offspring. Come to think of it, it automatically means you shouldn't exist in the first place. If your grandparents didn't have your parents, how can you exist at all? Well, these days scientists are certain that even if you did experience something like that, you'd still exist in the present. That's because the timeline that already exists has a way of adjusting itself, regardless of where people are in time and what they do. Or somehow get 1.21 gigawatts in a DeLorean and make like Marty McFly. <laughs> now, did you know that there's an astronomical object in which space and time actually swap places? How does that work? And what exactly does swapping space and time mean? Well, let's figure it out. Imagine that you're on a spacecraft. The vehicle can only move straight. Your path leads to some inevitable point, and you have no idea what lies ahead. You can only hope that it won't be too bad. Meanwhile, everything around you is complete madness. A chaotic collage of many historical events. What do you see? Ancient humans and dinosaurs? The birth of the universe? A uh, future? Who knows? That's what the universe would look like if we swapped time and space. And theoretically, this is what you would see if you fell into a black hole and somehow were able to survive. But how is something like this even possible? First of all, let's discuss time and space. Imagine drawing a light bulb on a sheet of paper. Then grab one more sheet and draw how it lit up. Right now, it's just a small circle of light. Another sheet? The circle of light is growing. It gets bigger and bigger in size, until finally, it turns into a giant circle. In real life, the bulb lights up in the blink of an eye. That's because the speed of light is the fastest in the universe. But here, on our drawings, we capture the propagation of light frame by frame. We see how, over time, the light has grown from a small dot to a large circle. But if you connect these circles, doesn't it remind you of some shape? For example, a cone? Yes, exactly! This is called a light cone, and time is the central axis of this cone. Why? Because light turns from a small dot into a large circle over time. To remember it, let's draw a time vector, an arrow inside the cone. It goes from the past to the future. Meanwhile, the circles are space. In space, we can move however we want, in any direction. We can move up or down, in zigzags, and so on. But no matter what zigzags we draw, along the timeline, we're always moving forward. We can't turn back in time, and we can't stop it. This helps us define time and space. Time is the direction in which the light cone is oriented. This is the direction where all our paths lead, and where our future inevitably lies. And space is the whole variety of directions perpendicular to the timeline. This is a straightforward graph. If it could be applied to the entire universe, then time would flow the same everywhere. However, if you've watched at least some popular sci-fi movies, you know that this isn't the case. In reality, time can be crazy. For example, if you're chilling near a black hole, what will be two hours for you may turn out to be 20 years for your friend on Earth. But why? Well, take a deep breath. Now gravity comes into play. Oh, I know about gravity. It's that thing that helps me to stand on the ground, you may think. But it's much, much more complicated than that. Gravity is one of the basic physical forces in our world, and it's incredibly powerful. In fact, she's such a girl boss that she can distort space and time. She can literally influence the speed of time like an almighty wizard. How? Well, let's take something slightly bigger than a life bulb. For example, a supernova. <laughs> Somewhere in the universe, a star has just made a boom. How do we know about it? Well, nothing in the universe, no sound, no radio waves, nothing, travels faster than light. So we'll know about the birth of a supernova only when we see it. And this will happen only when its light cone grows enough and reaches our planet. So the light cone grows and grows. So far, everything is fine. And finally, it reaches our planet. But there's a catch. 
You see, our planet is very massive, very massive, and it has pretty strong gravity. What happens then? Gravity changes the direction of the light cone. It begins to attract the cone to the center of our planet, and with it, it also attracts our arrow of time. That means it slows the time down, and the closer the light cone is to us, the more the arrow bends and the slower time goes. What does it mean? Well, for example, the fact that the watch on your ankle will lag behind the watch on your wrist, that your head is aging faster than your legs, and that astronauts in Earth's orbit age a little slower than people on Earth. This is what scientists call general relativity. Right. But how does this relate to our topic? How can we understand what will happen if we swap space and time? Nah, don't worry, we're almost there. Now, imagine a cosmic body with incredibly strong gravity. It bends time and space so much that it feels like they swap. This is a black hole. A black hole attracts absolutely everything to its center. No stars, planets, no light can escape from there. Let's say our light cone is approaching it. First, as usual, time begins to bend toward the center of the black hole, attracted by its gravity. But the gravity is very strong, so it bends more and more. And time goes slower and slower the closer you're to the center. In the end, the light cone crosses the boundary of the black hole the so-called event horizon. At this point, it gets so distorted that now it's literally pointing downwards. We can say that time has changed its direction. Time is pointing downwards. What kind of nonsense is that, you may ask? It'll be easier to explain in a real example. Imagine you're a crazy astronaut who decided to jump into a black hole. And there's an observer in the spaceship who watches you doing this for some reason. At first, for you, nothing changes. You look at your watch, you see that 5 minutes have passed, and everything's okay. But for the observer, first of all, you'll fall for a very long time. The observer has been sitting there for 50 years, and you're still falling. All because your time has slowed down. Secondly, since space is also distorted near the black hole, the observer will see how you'll begin to stretch like spaghetti. This is a scientific term, by the way. It's called spaghettification. And then you finally cross the event horizon. The observer doesn't see you anymore. Light cannot escape from a black hole, so your image won't reach the observer even if you're still inside. And what about you? What if you somehow survived? Remember, the time arrow is pointing to the center of the black hole. What does it mean? It means that now, the center of the black hole is your future. It isn't a place, it's a fate that you can't change. And wherever you came from, as well as the rest of the universe, no longer exists for you. Because now, it's not a place, but an event from the past. And since you can't turn back time, you'll never be able to come back. But what is around you? Complete chaos. The rays of light now move in all directions, forward, backward, and so on. The rays depicting the events of the past, the future, the present, all this is moving around you. In reality, space and time didn't swap places, but it feels like they did. Because in space, you can now only move forward, as if along a straight line. And time, reflected in the light rays, surrounds you everywhere and moves in all possible directions. And here we go back to the beginning. This horrifying example helps us imagine what it would feel like if time and space got reversed. Of course, all this is just theories and guesses. The very idea that we're moving in some one direction, the one we haven't chosen, and there's complete time chaos around, sounds quite frightening. And yet, it would be a very interesting experience. Sounds dangerous. Mm, Why don't you go first? It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. 
NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place, and Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world VHS 1256b is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets, but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot, but their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf, and thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, Back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor. But those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, 
are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age five to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. We fly away from Earth to look at it from a distance. It glows like a holiday tree. Big cities look like yellow spots at night. And during the day, we see strange structures, like a palm tree-shaped island in the UAE, or a dark band that runs all the way through China, the Great Wall. These are traces of human existence. Now let's point our telescope at other planets. Mars? It's just an empty, endless desert. Venus? Only rocks and volcanoes. Even if we look into distant space, all the planets out there are deserted and lifeless. Not a single trace of an extraterrestrial civilization. Many people are convinced that life on Earth isn't unique at all. Here's our galaxy. There are billions of sun-like stars. And here is the entire observable universe with billions of such galaxies. There's an almost infinite number of stars. And near each of them, there may be habitable worlds. But we may not have found life on other planets because it hides from us under the surface. For example, there's Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, slightly smaller than our moon. Its structure resembles a soft-boiled egg. Its surface is a hard crust of ice, but if you take a big enough drill, you can get to the liquid yolk, an ocean of water. Jupiter and its satellites are very far from the sun, so it's quite cold there, about 270 degrees below zero. So liquid water instantly turns to ice, but Jupiter has a strong gravitational force. That causes a lot of friction inside Europa, and its core heats up. The heat melts the ice, and we have a watery ocean under the surface. Water is the foundation of all life, so there could be simple bacteria in that ocean. And who knows, maybe there are other life forms out there. For example, weirdly shaped fish. Because of the weak gravity, their bodies are built differently. Or something like whales feeding on plankton. 
In 2009, scientists found a planet that is completely covered by an ocean, GJ1214. It's about 40 light years from Earth, and about 75% of its mass is water. Still, the temperatures on this planet are so high that water evaporates and takes the form of super liquid water. There's so much steam that it feels as thick as water itself. No life could exist in such conditions. But scientists have recently found at least 24 planets better than Earth and called them superhabitable. These planets orbit distant stars in their habitable zone. It's the sweet spot at a perfect distance from the star. In our solar system, Venus, Earth, and Mars are in this zone. A superhabitable planet must be 10% larger than Earth and have stronger gravity. That way, it can have a denser atmosphere. A temperature 8 degrees higher than on Earth would make the planet more humid. This would encourage a variety of living organisms there. These planets may be great for life, but it's hard to tell if there is life there already. The main marker that would confirm the existence of an advanced civilization there might be radio waves. Imagine a habitable planet similar to Earth. In the process of evolution, intelligent beings appeared there, like humans. They're much taller because of low gravity, and their eyes are adapted to the light from another star, much brighter than the sun. Sooner or later, this civilization will have to use radio waves to communicate with each other. We can think of these waves as loud sound from speakers. Here's Earth. We're now actively using radio waves, and the noise coming from our planet is pretty serious. If a neighboring planet had radio telescopes, big dishes that catch these waves, they would realize that life is blooming here. There are many radio telescopes on Earth that are pointed into distant space, waiting for a signal from aliens. But we haven't received anything yet. Still, that doesn't mean there isn't a planet somewhere in the universe that emits radio waves. It's all about distance. We're jumping 200 light years to another star. Suppose there's a planet X where life exists. The civilization here is advanced enough to use radio waves, so they release the first wave into space. Our radio telescopes won't be able to pick it up until 200 years later. This also works the other way around. Radio communication on Earth has only existed since 1895. Our radio signal won't reach planet X until 2095, and only then the aliens will hear our voice. But this radio noise doesn't stay for long. Every year, our technology improves, and our radio noise decreases. We're beginning to use mobile communication, cable TV, and fiber optics. This all reduces the volume of our planet in the radio spectrum, and soon, it will simply become invisible to other planets. The same thing is happening on the other side. So, the radio waves coming from civilizations are a brief blip on the cosmic scale. And we can't accept radio silence as proof that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. A giant telescope, which could take a direct photo of a possibly inhabited planet, would change the situation. We zoom in on the photo, and there it is! We see alien cities with tall buildings and lots of antennas. But now, we can't look that far away. We can take pictures of Mars and its satellites, and even their quality misleads us. For example, Sidonia. It looks just like a human face on Mars. We thought there used to be an ancient civilization there that made some sort of sculpture or memorial. More extravagant theories said it was the remains of a giant human, and there's a whole body of it under the sands of Mars. But in fact, it was just a hill. Strong winds blew out some hollows there, and when there was a shadow in those hollows, we took them for human eyes and a mouth. Or a monolith on Mars' satellite Phobos. We found a smooth rock there that was almost as tall as the Pyramid of Cheops. The news has spawned many theories about the civilization that built it, but it turned out to be no more than a rock. The infinite number of stars and worlds around them almost guarantees the existence of other civilizations, so why wouldn't they come to Earth, right? We think that life throughout the universe develops in similar scenarios. The emergence of simple life forms, followed by evolution and growth of a technologically advanced civilization. But just like on Earth, Cataclysms happen there too, causing mass extinctions. Meteorites, for example. Perhaps there was a civilization out there ready to go into outer space, but a huge meteorite, like the one that wiped the dinosaurs off the Earth's surface, made that civilization disappear, and life on that planet began a new cycle from scratch. In addition, the more advanced the civilization, the greater the risk of its self-destruction. Scientists might conduct experiments in machines like the Large Hadron Collider and accidentally create a black hole there. 
It would begin to swallow everything around it and grow in size. Soon, all the super-developed cities of this civilization and the entire planet would simply disappear. Another possibility for super-advanced civilizations is to travel through wormholes. Those are tunnels in space-time between universes. Aliens might travel through them and lose interest in going back. But it's also possible that life on Earth is unique. That's because our planet was formed thanks to a number of incredible coincidences. The first is the location of our solar system in the galaxy. In the Milky Way, there are constant fireworks of exploding supernovae. The radiation from these explosions destroys everything around it at great distances. Our solar system is right in the sweet spot of the galactic orbit where we're safe from such explosions. Another factor is the Moon. One theory of the formation of the Moon says that about 4.5 billion years ago, a meteorite the size of Mars crashed into us. If the impact had been straight, the Earth would have just broken apart. And if that meteorite had only scratched the Earth, the pieces would have just flown away. But the collision occurred precisely so that part of the meteorite remained in Earth's orbit and formed the Moon. Then, the Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation and heated our core with gravity. Only then, our planet developed a magnetic field, which protects us from the solar wind. Other scientists believe that life outside Earth may be biochemically different. Carbon and water are the basis of our bodies, but carbon could be replaced with silicon or phosphorus, and water could be replaced with ammonia or methane. These atoms could form molecules of different shapes and perhaps assemble into a living organism. Life based on such elements would be unlike anything seen on Earth.